World Architecture News. Hello, welcome to this week. BIM is now an established part of the architectural furniture. We all know what it is and what it does. But while some firms are racing ahead with the technology and pushing the boundaries, others have yet to adopt at all. Today we talk to David Light at HOK and Pete Baxter from Autodesk about the future of BIM. Good afternoon. Uh, we've got David Light from HOK. Hello, David. Hello. And, and Pete Baxter from Autodesk. Hi there. In our opening, um, we, we, we talked about uh, the, the kind of two camps we have in architecture at the moment. I mean, those, those are, uh, of adopters and, and non-adopters uh, of BIM. And I gather, uh, David, that you're actually one of the first category. I would say yes, very much so, <laughs> very much so. It, it seems that it, if you kind of embrace this technology uh, and just kind of go with it, as, as I gather you guys are doing at HOK, I mean, it can be a huge asset, can't it? Yeah, certainly. This is what we're kind of finding. I mean, we've made a, um, a firm-wide commitment um, in around about 2006. I mean, before we used the Revit technology, uh, we used um, architectural desktop. Um, to a greater or lesser degree, well, I wouldn't sus- suggest it was a major success in terms of deployment, but um, certainly that was the vision. Uh, the, the business uh, as, a, as a whole understood the benefits of building information modeling. We're very fortunate that our CEO, CEO Patrick McLeamy, um, is head of the IAI, um, Alliance of, uh, International Alliance of Interoperability, so it's very, very passionate about the, uh, the, the process of BIM. So it's very much driven from the top, and which makes the the decision making and, and push for BIM a lot, lot easier. And it was also one of our five uh, key business drivers as well. So, so Pete, you, you must see a, a wide range of, of architects, um, uh, you know, both, both, both ends of the scale as far as adoption goes. What are you finding as the, the current obstacles to, to adoption? So I, I think, you, firstly, David mentioned that they had senior level buy-in. And of course, that is that is critical. We're finding that where where a commitment is made at a company wide level and there's a real desire to, to make it successful, that's the first one. So it's it's a little bit like that it's the cultural aspect, it's leading from the front and, and demonstrating that there is that company wide commitment because BIM is a is a process change, a very valuable one, but nonetheless one that requires that level level of, of commitment. Of course, you know, there's there's there's, there's many challenges that that, um, that architects are, are facing today and designers in general are facing today around the economic situation, which requires, you know, some, some, some investment in, in, in this change. So we're finding that, you know, companies who, who are doing what, what you kind of hope that people will do in a, in, a, in a softer economy is invest for the future is, you know, once they get over that, once they understand the return on that investment, then we start to see some, some very, very positive, positive results. The other aspect of it, of course, is, is available resources in the market. I think you know, HOK is a great example of, 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 of developing and training internally, but also hiring the right people from the external market. So, you know, Autodesk invests a lot in education. So we're spending a, a lot of our time and resources in putting curriculums together to work with, with some of the key colleges around the world to ensure that, that designers, architects, and engineers coming out of school have an understanding of, of BIM and also specifically of our solutions so they can go into these practices, take the, nest, the right skills with them, and help those um, companies be productive as quickly as possible. Um, I mean, David, when you said that you've made a firm, HOK have made a firm-wide commitment, I mean, that that's a little bit of a kind of unilateral statement, isn't it? One of the big advantages of BIM is, is getting the other uh, members of the design team on board. I mean, are you, are you having to kind of wave the flag on that, or are they coming on board naturally? I, I, I think that's, that's starting to change. I, I think, um, obviously, with the government's, um, UK government's push uh, towards BIM, uh, and there's obviously, you can't pick up a, a piece of press without seeing uh, that statement um, about the need for BIM and, uh, and being far more efficient. And obviously, there's a 20% reduction and things like that that have been talked about. So once upon a time, it was a real hard push to talk to uh, partners, um, uh, consultants that we would normally actively work with to, to embrace the technology. And it is a technology embrace to some extent, but then obviously that's aligned, as Pete said, with process change 
uh, and some, to some extent the collaboration is key. Um, so we are seeing a change, which is great news. We uh, naturally gravitate to our partners that will want to work with us. Um, and certainly in, in the US, it's slightly different to how we, we work with um, consultants than we do in the UK. We don't always get a chance to pick them in the UK, but very much so um, in the US. So, that's, so this, uh, to some extent, I think the US is, is probably two or three years ahead of the UK. And, um, certainly speaking to others within the marketplace and others from, from all to death, they would probably agree with, with that comment. Um, but it, it, it takes time. But, um, but the great thing about it is when, when you do work together and you sit around the table day one and you, you define a strategy and I think it, it, uh, and a process change, that once people see, it's, it's almost that eureka moment, once people understand it and start seeing that change, it becomes a lot, lot easier. Uh, and and then once you've done one, you know, coming along to do the next project, it, it makes life so much easier. And I gather that you're um, you're actually even kind of pushing the boundaries and and, and working with some some apps. Some, uh, you've got something working on on iPads together. Yeah, we're doing a number of different things. I mean, as Pete rightly said, but, you know, our BIM journey started a long time ago. So you know, what we're trying to do now is look into to other things. We're saying, well, look, you've got all this rich data. And it's all well and good having it tied up into the into the computer boxes and uh, and then obviously a bit of print deliverables and and things like that. That's all really cool. But how can we extend our services? How can we make HOK stand out from the crowd? How can we use this rich information to sell the vision over and above? And it, it, it's it's about really giving clients reassurance that that they you know you know in terms of return on investment. So we've done a couple of things. We've started to take our information and put it into iPad apps. So you, again, it's a re, rehash of the same information, but delivering it in a different way. Um, we've also done some smart things around using uh, touchscreen technology with uh, the Revit uh, tools, uh, which by default doesn't, you know, Revit doesn't work with a touchscreen out of the box, but we've worked with a firm that's been able to um, basically mimic the use of um, hand gestures to mouse clicks. Um, and we've been able to use those for um, a particular project where we are getting room sign-off, um, which is uh, and, and engaging with a, in the client in that decision-making process, which has been really, really useful. Yeah, I, I heard, I think you relayed earlier an, an instance of that displaying uh, or showing a client something being actually sort of amended in real time around the table. I mean, that, that must be, that must be an, a, an awesome tool to, to have at your disposal. It, and it is, and I think that, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I, I mean, I take it with a pinch of salt, and I, because it's, I get so in, excited about the use of technology that it becomes sort of second nature. But I think to the client, when you're actually displaying it to the client, you can see that, you can see their eyes light up. I mean, they say, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. Uh, and, uh, and you've got also to remember that many clients don't always understand drawings. But you give them a 3D image and you start rotating it around in real time and you start to make those adjustments uh, and you involve them in that decision-making process. Um, I think that you you get them on board a lot quicker. So, so Pete, I mean, is that part of um, Revit's e evolution now? The the apps and the the iPads. So, I, I think you know, David um, hit on a, a good point there. Really, it, you know, we need to remember that the the key thing in in BIM is the eye. It's the information, and and that's a a very valuable source of information that can be used for many different purposes. Whether it's for optioneering at the front end, whether it's around constructability, value engineering, tendering right the way through to, to operations and maintenance. You know, our, our view on, on how that information is shared is, is in a way, it's, 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 it's limited, limitless. It's limited only by, by the technology. So what you've, you've seen a lot more now with our BIM 360 initiative, it's moving out of the realms of pure design because the first incarnation of BIM was all around the coordination of the graphical data to moving more into supporting that, that whole process. And in deciding how we best support that process, we have to start thinking a little bit about how people want to work. You know, with the global trends that are, are happening now, we can't assume that the right people and the whole of the design team are sitting in one physical location. 
they're sitting in, in many different offices around the world. There's some home workers, there's site workers, there's some people, you know, potentially and a, a, a furniture designer designing a bespoke piece of equipment of, of furniture, maybe sitting in a field somewhere somewhere in the Southern Alps. We yeah. don't know, but the important thing is that you make that information available anywhere. So the cloud-based applications that we're developing, the iPad and, and iPhone applications, mobile apps that we're, we're, we're developing and, and, um, and publishing now, are making, are adding that degree of flexibility, and that's really what it's all about. As David said, you can't assume everyone can read drawings, but by providing the right information in the right format, platform independent, that's how you aid communication, that's how you ensure better decision making is, is made, and that's how you ensure that, that schemes are, are supported. And of course, our job as a technology company is to make that information available in as many sources and as easily accessible as possible. People are now just pulling out um, iPads all the time and just to, to use use it as a, to demonstrate some point or to show in a, a reference building or something. It, uh, the, 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 as you say, it, things are kind of moving out into the cloud and further away it's, it's really interesting i mean the other advantage of the of the cloud of course is it also it free it frees up processing power so you know if we've we've gone beyond the the times of someone who wanted to produce a high-res walkthrough needing to have terabytes of processing power at their immediate disposal now you can have you know by accessing render farms over the cloud then you've Pretty much, the, that infinite amount of processing power is now available to to a, an, an individual, a, a student working from home, even as it is to one of these mega specialist houses. So it's completely changed the the dynamic of of, of the of the um, of the overall design market and the and the and the design profession. You know, processing power is no longer the limit, or the processing power you have on your desktop is no longer the limit to your capabilities. So, David, what would you say are the are the major design challenges being faced by architects today? I mean, we've mentioned the financial market, but what 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 about sort of design challenges? Where, where do you see that sitting at the moment? I think the, I think one of the, the big issues is understanding the client requirements. I mean, we, we talk about BIM, but I don't necessarily think architects fully understand the client requirements in, in, in terms of is what um, Pete described as BIM 360. I, I think they understand it from, well, OK, we're going to design a building, OK, and we have some client um, requirements in terms of maybe area requirements. But I don't think they're looking at the broader service that's potentially available. I mean, to, to, to my mind, I think, unfortunately, architects have kind of lost ground um, to the rest of the industry. I think they've been so focused around wanting to go, do good design, uh, and that's really what they're trained to do, that the bigger picture of life cycle and being able to extend the scope of service has kind of been lost. And I actually think that's an opportunity, certainly with HOK, we see that as a massive opportunity moving forward. You know, almost working backwards with how, what, what data does the client need to manage his building? Work from that and then, you know, build that into the scope and then work, move forward. Uh, so, so certainly that's something that we see um, within our business as being a major business driver over the next couple of years. And BIM, without doubt, will it help us achieve some of those goals. It is interesting because we are we are hearing more and more about um, the need for buildings to be to be monitored and to get to get historical data of how buildings are performing to to use that as you know, evidence to base future designs on. So, I guess that um, you yeah, know Revit and and the the whole BIM uh, technology would, would is working completely in sync with that that kind of trend. Certainly, I think yeah. I mean, I know that um, I'm sure people will concur. But we've, that Autodesk are doing some amazing technology research around um, life cycle management and testing you know the building has been modeled in revit and then i think they've got a, i can't i think it might even be in manchester um uh, new hampshire where they've got sensors connected to the uh, building management system and they're able to track the position of people and movement in, in the building they're finding that certain areas um, of the building aren't being used at a certain uh, times of the day or certain times of the week, so they shut the systems down. And I suspect that you know, linking that and capturing that uh, data, um, as Peter described, it's all about the eye, will help um, uh, us produce more efficient buildings in the future. I mean, if, if, if 
the reality of life is that you have this floor plate and you don't need to heat and, and cool it or, or light it, then these systems will help track that. But without being able to use the, the technology to track the movement of people, then you will never really know. So I think you know, what David described there was capturing information, and that's really important. But I think what we also have the potential to do now is to capture knowledge. If you look at the, the manufacturing process versus the building, building industry, if you go back to manufacturing 15 years ago when they started digital prototyping, building 3D models, slightly different challenge because they were effectively, you know, fine-tuning a design and then going off and producing 20 million of them in, in, in construction and architecture and engineering. Everything was seen to be redesigned from first principles all the time. And you were, to a large extent, reliant on the specialist knowledge of, of a key individual in, in, in the office. As you start to capture the kind of data that, that David described, what you're starting to build up is, is, is knowledge models that can inform the decision and can help to optimize a, a design further down the line. So, so actually, you know, as, as, as we get richer and richer data and more and more data on which to make our decisions, it will drive better decisions, which ultimately drives better design and better, better buildings and better facilities for the clients. Well, thank you very much for your time, both of you, and um, thank, thanks a lot. Cheers. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. World Architecture News. Thank you.